Nearly two years into the pandemic, this conversation is an attempt to take a step back and see where we're at. Looking at how things have changed over the last months, what we haven't adapted to, especially now that the virus is almost certainly endemic and what needs to change. It's with Will Eden, who's an expert in biotech and health startups, and we're speaking after he posted a Twitter thread that went viral that seemed like a really balanced summary of where the blind spots have been. How do you sort of transition from this being a crisis into something that we have to live with? And I think that a lot of the policies that make sense during a crisis don't make sense once a pandemic has become endemic, right? And that's a word that they really don't want to use. I think at some point, like trying to get COVID cases to zero actually made sense. And it just seems like that's literally impossible now. Like there, there, there's no world in which we don't have COVID forever. So the question is, what makes sense in that world? We talked about how COVID was just dangerous enough to create maximum division in society. In a weird way, I think the virus actually fell into this weird middle ground. I think that if it had been any less severe, I think people would have actually been able to just kind of like brush it off as like, we had a bad flu year. It's clearly worse than that. But I also think if the virus were like 10 times more deadly, I think as a society, we never would have gotten into this weird world of like, oh, is this like a left wing issue or like a right wing issue? And instead, we, we got this weird middle ground where it's severe, but it's not extremely severe. And, and it's sort of just not bad enough that that the forces of politics were kind of able to, to seep in there. And how the mandates have been a huge error that were tearing apart a fragile society. To me, it just feels so unnecessary, right? I, I feel like we just lost this huge opportunity to try to bridge a divide there. And instead we just inflamed it. And that's why I'm just I'm, I, like, I'm so frustrated and sad because I think it is literally costing people's lives. And just to let you know quickly, we're gonna be running our groundbreaking Sense Making 101 course again in February, 2022, which is an eight week process with guest faculty including John Bavaki, Daniel Schmachtenberger, Sarah Ness, and Diane Musher Hamilton. So check the show notes below for details and hope you enjoy this conversation. We're speaking because you released this really interesting thread on Twitter and I read it. And I, I just, just before coming on again, I went, read through some of the reactions and some of the quote tweets and the general feeling was relief. There's a lot of people yeah. who said, oh, thank, thank goodness someone has articulated um, this in a way that doesn't feel like it falls into either of the camps. And that was my feeling as well. I've, I've been talking a lot, and we've been talking a lot on this channel about the COVID thesis and the COVID antithesis and how it's polarizing into camps and how the synthesis position probably takes the best from each. And right. that really felt like your thread really took it told a story of the pandemic, like where we started from and, and where we've ended up in a way that made sense of some of the kind of overreach of the authorities, of what we didn't know, what we now know, what they're still getting wrong in a way that I think just felt very, yeah, it, it felt like a relief as well. Um, so just before we kind of go through it, and I'd love to, to unpack it in more detail, it's probably sure. worth saying that you're not a you're not a doctor, you're not a, neither of us are medical professionals. Um, right. what, what is your background and what have you been paying attention to during COVID? Yeah. So I have been in the healthcare space, um, either working in it or investing in it for almost, uh, 10 years now. So, um, no, it's true. Um, I'm not a doctor. Um, I do have a fair bit of knowledge about the space for someone who's not formally trained in it. Um, I have invested in a ton of companies, including, vaccines, drugs, devices. So I'm basically very well versed in the space, but, you know, obviously, you know, I'm not a doctor and nothing that I say is like medical advice of any kind, right? <laughs> Coming from a sort of slightly more detached place maybe helps because the, the response to the pandemic is a hyper object, as a lot of people have talked about. Like it's something, it's, it's almost ungraspable because there's so many different factors and I think maybe if you have a singular focus, say on deaths, for example, and to the exclusion of everything else, you're going to make decisions that are going to influence so many other things to do with mental health, to do with like you have to juggle or hold in mind lots of these different facts at the same time, which is what I think you were doing in that thread. And also, I'd say that 
it's been interesting since the beginning of the pandemic that some of the most interesting and influential pieces have come from non-medical people. I'm thinking particularly of Thomas Puyo, who at the beginning of the pandemic wrote two hugely influential pieces. I think the first one was called uh, Coronavirus, Why You Must Act Now, which had 40 million views and kind of created like public policy around the world. And then the hammer and the dance. And he was a Silicon Valley exec who just delved into the the details, put together this incredibly detailed piece. And then, so I don't think it's disqualifying. I think a lot of the the decisions or a lot of the really influential pieces have been from out from non-experts. So I wasn't disqualifying you by, by, by saying that. But yeah, sure. I mean, I think also it is worth noting, right? Like there are very few doctors in Congress, right? Like our president isn't a doctor, right? Like on some level, like civilians in essence are kind of in charge of policy, right? And they take the sort of guidance and advice of experts, but in the end, it's non-experts that actually have to try to make these calls. And they're very, very hard calls. Yeah. Should we go through the the, the thread and your kind of summary of where you think we're at now relative to the start of the pandemic? Sure. Yeah, um, I think there are a few major points that I wanted to get across. Um, One of them is basically, how do you sort of transition from this being a crisis into something that we have to live with? And I think that a lot of the policies that make sense during a crisis don't make sense once a pandemic has become endemic, right? And that's a word that they really don't want to use because it, you know, basically implies a lot of things about where the whole like trajectory of this is going in a lot of ways that sort of don't fit with current policy. Um, And so I think uh, there's been a little bit of a a hesitancy to acknowledge like, yeah, I think at some point, like trying to get COVID cases to zero actually made sense. And it just seems like that's literally impossible now. Like there's no world in which we don't have COVID forever. So the question is what makes sense in that world, right? And um, I think that this is just kind of a natural human instinct, right? Um, when we're kind of in the weeds and like super focused, right? They're, they're, they're really just thinking about how should we shift policy on the margin right now? And I think they need to kind of step back and take this global view of like, okay, if we were dropped into this same situation right now, what would our policies be? Right? And it's very unclear that the current set of policies we have makes sense if you kind of take this with fresh eyes, right? Um, so yeah, I don't think I don't think these people are like evil or malicious or something like that. I think they're genuinely trying to help people and there just haven't hasn't been some like like defined point in time when they said we're going to reevaluate policy now, right? Um, and I think failure to do that is probably at the heart of a lot of what's currently going wrong. Um, I don't think it's the only problem, but I think that was a major one that I was trying to highlight there. Um, Mm -hmm. I do think also just in general, um, there hasn't been enough of a focus on costs versus benefits. You know, Um, there there really has been this kind of single minded focus on we just have to, you know, lower COVID at all costs and at all costs doesn't really make sense. Yeah. And I liked your reframing, which is something I'd thought about myself as well, like how the expectation of the vaccines and the sort of focus on the vaccines preventing spread of disease has generally not been borne out to be as effective as people thought it would. And so the cost benefit ratio now is stopping severe illness in people who take the vaccines, which is a should be a shift in terms of the cost benefit analysis and then putting it more onto the individual which makes a a lot of sense. It sort of changes that there still seems to be, as you pointed out, this kind of direction towards vaccines as a public policy initiative rather than an opportunity for you individually to lower your risk. And that completely changes the the nature of the, the decision and also the nature of the kind of policies that should be involved, which then impacts the idea behind mandates and behind all of these other Could you could you unpack that a little bit? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, Yeah, I think I think there's there's a few things going on there. But yeah, the sort of core frame of what we now know about how vaccines work means that this is much more a choice that we make for our own health. Right. So 
how we got here, right? The early vaccine trials looked really, really good, right? You know, 90 plus percent efficacy on cases, right? Like folks who were just vaccinated basically didn't get sick. And that sort of gave us this path of like, okay, well, if you're actually lowering the caseload by that much, if everyone's vaccinated, you know, plausibly, you can get to a point where COVID falls to very, very low levels. Well, we didn't actually end up seeing that happen, right? We got more data in. And I think that the sort of implications of that data haven't really been fully processed. And effectively, what we learned is it's very, very good still, even now, versus severe disease. So if you're looking at deaths, hospitalizations, complications, it seems very good, very, very good. Um, if you look at the you know, probability of, of, of preventing a symptomatic infection, but also then passing COVID on to someone else, the vaccines really have, have sort of failed to live up to that first study. And I think that in retrospect, this actually isn't super surprising because like the other coronaviruses that infect humans are basically like common cold viruses and we can catch them every single year, right? So clearly there's something about the biology of how our body interacts with this entire family of viruses, which is suggestive of, you know, we're never going to get permanent immunity to it, right? So given that, right, we're probably going to get COVID multiple times over the course of our lifetime, right? Two, we can't necessarily stop it from spreading to other people, certainly not without extreme measures, because it's actually pretty infectious, right? So given that, that we no longer have the possibility of kind of permanent lasting herd immunity, and given that we know that someone who was vaccinated, you know, more than five or six months ago can also spread it and catch it, that sort of leaves us in a situation where the only thing that we can do is basically reduce the severity of the disease, right? Try to make it as close to, you know, a cold or flu as possible. And it's still worse than that. But I think over time, you know, through multiple exposures, through boosters, I basically think we will sort of get to a point where COVID is just in the background and it's just like another seasonal disease that we sometimes get, right? And then then there's this, this question of if that's, the kind of long-term outcome, when do we shift from short-term to long-term thinking, right? Yeah, and also you frame that within things like the, the mandates, for example, which then have to be seen. So again, you could imagine kind of governments who are looking at this and you look at Germany or Austria that have made the decisions about mandates, which a lot of us look at and think are kind of a step too far not only a step too far in terms of like the logic, but also a step too far in terms of their impact on society because it doesn't make sense from a purely kind of, um, as you said, effectively something like that is, is tearing apart a fragile society yeah. for a minimal benefit. Yeah, um, I, I, I personally find this very, very concerning. Um, the degree to which the pandemic was politicized I sort of feel like there was maybe a month in the start where it really felt like we're all in this together and there's no sides, right? It's like humanity versus the virus. And then sides emerged within like one or two months. Like it was so crazy to watch and, and like which side people fell on, like flipped also over that time period too, um, where at first on the right, you had folks that were like much more scared of like <laughs> this virus, right? Um, you would sort of think like, shouldn't, you know, conservatives be concerned about like novel pathogens, right? That, that sort of made sense, but then they kind of flipped their position into like, well, it's kind of not as serious as we thought. So we shouldn't actually take this seriously. Um, and then on the left, they were actually really skeptical of the vaccine because Trump was, was trying to push for a vaccine as quickly as possible, which I think was absolutely the right call. Like that was the one thing that actually went right is that we got an effective vaccine quickly right? There's the one right thing we did. Every, every other policy has just been like, uh, yeah, it's been, it's been quite bad on so many fronts, but like the vaccine was like the one thing going right. But because Trump was pushing it, they were doubting the, you know, impartiality and like actual efficacy of a vaccine, right? Um, now after the, you know, US election that then flipped again, Right. So now they're super, super pro vaccine and the right is super skeptical of vaccines. 
even though it was a vaccine that was like made and pushed by Trump. Right. So it's clear that like the the kind of political thinking that has just been so like present in everything for the last like five years, like took over COVID so fast. And I think that really just kind of like, A, I think it prevented us from thinking about policy well um, and turned it into basically just another front on this culture war, which just seems absolutely crazy, right? Mm. And, and then B, um, what we've actually noticed is that the efficacy of the vaccine mandate has been very, very small, right? And if you look at the curve of folks that have gotten vaccinated, there's barely even a blip, right? And so what effect has the mandate actually had? You know, at best, it's gotten a couple extra percent of the population vaccinated, which like, yeah, that's good, right? That's probably on the order of saving like several thousand lives, right? But what is the cost of the vaccine mandate, right? Like that is a very heavy handed approach for something where there's like not broad societal consensus, we should actually be doing this. And in a weird way, I think the virus actually fell into this weird middle ground. I think that if it had been any less severe, I think people would have actually been able to just kind of like brush it off as like, we had a bad flu year. It's clearly worse than that. But I also think if the virus were like 10 times more deadly, I think as a society, we never would have gotten into this weird world of like, oh, is this like a left wing issue or like a right wing issue? Like that, I think wouldn't have wouldn't have actually happened. And I think, you know, if 10 percent or worse, you know, 20 percent of folks were dying, I basically think there would just be universal consensus on like we need the vaccine. We need drugs. This is very serious. We have to take it seriously. Lockdowns like fine. Like. And instead, we we got this weird middle ground where it's severe, but it's not extremely severe. And, and it's sort of just not bad enough that that the forces of politics were kind of able to, to seep in there. Yeah, this is something I think about that people seem to kind of fall into camps of sort of certainty on both sides. Like on one side, it's like my body, my choice. On the other side, it's you have an obligation to society. And, and the truth is that we're both like we're humans. We are sovereign individuals and we also have obligations to others. And we're balancing those all the time. Like, do you wear yeah. a mask in this situation? Do you have a test before you go and see it? Like, and what I find fascinating is people abstract a universal rule, a kind of libertarianism or kind of social obligation. But if you change any of the factors and they kind of treat that as a universal but if you were to change any of the factors, it would change the calculation. Like you realize that those are only kind of considered universal because the, the virus is relatively benign if you're in good health. It's, and if you were to ratchet up like the, the virulence of the, of the virus or the, the danger of it or any of those factors, you wouldn't, you wouldn't get such a kind of um, a, a level of certainty about so many of the, of the conversation. And, and so much of it is contextual. And it's contextual holding so many of these different things in place at a time, as you pointed out by saying, well, vaccine mandates, they don't work. The cost to society of enforcing them in terms of in an already fragile, polarized environment is, is, is clearly not correct. It's sort of, it's all contextual. And that's what I find, I think people find difficult because we want universal rules. We want there to be hard and fast responses and, and government especially needs that to be the case. So it's kind yeah. of, it, you're right. It's, it's in the perfect position where there are no universal answers and everything is contextual. Therefore it's an eternal argument. Yeah. And, and I think in that sort of case, we need to recognize that the best thing that we can do is to try to not cause people to really dig in on it and to basically just like, gradually incentivize them to do it, right? Like there were states that just rolled out cash payments. Like if you get this shot, we'll just pay you money, right? And and like that just seems like the kind of like win-win situation that, that we should be pursuing. And that basically was the policy for a while during the kind of middle point where a lot of people had gotten vaccinated, but not everybody yet. And it really did seem like maybe we were starting to get closer to to some kind of like societal tipping point of like, well, it's actually just okay to sort of do it or not. And we're going to like encourage folks to do it. 
but then I feel like the mandate almost came at, at like the perfect time to, to, to sort of cut off that natural process. Um, like we had just gotten full FDA approval, you know, for Pfizer. And that was like one of the things that folks were like sort of waiting for. It's like, well, is this like emergency use authorization? Are we totally sure it's safe? Has the FDA really looked at it? Like, well, that that started to put that to rest. I mean, again, maybe for only a small percent of the total population, but that matters, right? That's that that is a few more percent, right? And and it was just done by things working their way through the system, not through a mandate. And I basically just worry that like the blowback that it's caused is going to get people to just not take this vaccine under any circumstances. Like that, mm-hmm. that is ultimately the part that I'm worried about. I, I would like people to be able to a year from now, change their minds and get it right. Mm-hmm. But, but if they're dug in, in this stance, I think they're not going to do that. I don't think they're going to change their mind. We sort of didn't give people a sort of avenue to just admit like, okay, maybe this actually makes sense and just do it right now. It's like a part of their core identity. Like, no, I'm never going to do that. I'm never going to do that on principle. Right. And like, Oh, that's such a wasted, difficult opportunity. (laughs) Yeah. I I have friends who are not vaccinated with (coughs) who don't have sort of very serious doubts about the vaccine, but they just feel this pressure to do it is intolerable and they won't go along with it like there's there's just a sort of ethical principle of no the more that you press me the more that you um restrict what i can't i can do the more i'm not going to do it and that definitely is a factor for a lot of people i think yeah and and it to me, it just feels so unnecessary, right? I, I feel like we just lost this huge opportunity to try to bridge a divide there. And instead we just inflamed it. And that's why I'm just I'm, I, like, I'm so frustrated and sad because I think it is literally costing people's lives, right? Mm-hmm. Like there, there are lives at stake. There, there are people that if they'd gotten vaccinated wouldn't have gotten as sick as they did and mm-hmm. been left with permanent injury or death, right? But we're just sort of leaving those people by the roadside because, you know, we couldn't sort of get them on board with this plan, which, you know, a little more than half the country wanted. And what, what are the counter arguments to your perspective that you put forward? I think the main one was pressure on hospitals, hospital capacity, pressure on hospitals. And do, do you think that that, the position that you articulated changes because of Omicron at all? Yeah. I mean, it's funny, right? The sort of timing of that thread was like just before it once again got like really, really bad, right? (laughs) Um, Yeah. Look, as far as we can tell um, with Omicron, the odds of having a breakthrough case are higher than they were, you know, Um, using these like in vitro neutralization assays, which are super sketchy. I don't know, maybe vaccine efficacy is 30%, maybe it's 50%. Maybe if you had the infection plus a booster, maybe it's like 70%, but it's effectively, you know, you, you are more, more likely than not probably going to get the new variant, right? Even, even if you were sick, it's, it's probably a a rough toss up, right? Um, In terms of severe disease, it still seems to be holding up pretty well. So now obviously this form seems to spread faster. So I think there is a reasonable chance that in certain areas um, we are going to see, you know, local hospital overcrowding. And unfortunately, I think that that is a somewhat inevitable consequence of just there being seasonal infectious diseases. Um, As I do mention in that thread, you know, hospitals have had to go to overflow just for seasonal flu. Right. And we have something that's more serious than that. And there are surge practices in place for things like seasonal flu that have actually had to be used. So this is somewhat battle tested. Um, now, of course, this is obviously a much more serious disease. Right. So we, we can't quite as easily expand like ICU room. Right. But if you need just a bed, someone monitoring you, some oxygen, that is something that is actually a little bit more scalable. And one thing that I found sort of unfortunate over the course of this pandemic is there's there's not been as much of a push to expand hospital capacity as I would have liked. Um, and I think that that the sort of causes behind that is is probably longer than we can get to in this 
um, one episode, but there are a lot of sort of gatekeepers in the medical world that um, that have pretty effectively prevented expanding, you know, which kinds of people can sort of give certain services, right? There, there are lots of things that like a doctor can do that a nurse legally can't do, right? Um, and there are things that like a nurse can legally do that random person off the street can't do, right? So like there, 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 there are bottlenecks to sort of expanding capacity, but uh, to, to a certain degree, I think this has been like a self-inflicted wound. Like there certainly is more that we could have done. And it just once more comes back to this single-minded focus on, no, we just have to keep cases low. Right. Rather than say, like, let's create much more overflow room for people that are having moderately severe cases. Right. They'll 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 do OK if they only need oxygen. Right. Like that, that that sort of thing is something that we could have been scaling up for two years. Right. And yeah, there's 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 been some. Right. But like not to the kind of surge capacity that we would expect for a seasonal, severe, common virus. Mm. And what do you think is our way out now? What do you think the we should be doing? Yeah, I mean, one good like thing that literally uh, just happened is the FDA finally approved the pretty good looking Pfizer drug. Um, it seems like uh, Paxlovid in the early studies, but also some of uh, the follow up cohort, something about ninety percent effective and that basically stacks with the protection that you get from a vaccine. So, you know, continuing to invest in new drugs, scaling up, like that, that I think should be probably the number one focus. Um, given the wave of Omicron coming, I am on the fence about whether we're gonna see massive hospital crowding or not. Um, in part, again, given that so much of the population now has at least partial immunity. Um, I do think it's also worth noting that like the more people that sort of get Omicron, the more we're continuing to develop, you know, our own immune response to this virus. Right. And so each subsequent wave shouldn't be quite as bad. Right. Um, even 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 if the virus is, is sort of intrinsically as severe, you know, well over 90 percent of like most populations have either gotten covid or gotten a vaccine. Right. So like we we are sort of in this world where we're just going to be partially protected almost no matter what variant comes up. Right. And so in that world, again, it will probably be on the order of, you know, years rather than months. But like eventually we will all have gotten covid a couple of different times, maybe new booster vaccines targeted at new variants. Right. And, and through some overlapping patchwork of this stuff, plus efficacious drugs, which we now have. Right. All of that combined, you know, maybe it's still going to be more deadly than the flu, but maybe only a little bit more deadly or something, whereas before it was a lot more deadly, right? So I do think we sort of have to accept that, like, there is never going to be one end point where it's done, right? There, there's never one end point where no one dies, right? And we have to get back into this mindset of what are the costs? What are the benefits? Are we you know, doing everything that we can to sort of stop people from dying, but not necessarily stop people from catching COVID sometimes, maybe even annually, right? Mm -hmm. This is a virus that we now have to live with and, and it's something that we have to learn to live with. And it's never going to be perfect. It's never going to be zero. And that can't be the expectation. Yeah, I guess it's the balancing, stopping people from dying, from stopping people from living. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great way of putting it, yeah. Our ability to make sense of the world is breaking down. We're making more and more consequential choices with worse and worse sense making to inform those choices, which is kind of running increasingly fast through the woods, increasingly blind. Over the last two years, Rebel Wisdom has interviewed some of the world's top thinkers. Now we've brought them together for an eight week online course, Sense Making 101 with Daniel Schmachtenberger, Diane Musho hamilton John Viveki, and more. Improve your sense-making, develop your sovereignty, and join a wider community looking to do the same. <laughs>